Thank you, Martina. And hello to everyone. Um, uh, it's really nice to be a part of this conference. And um, thank you for inviting me, Martina, to speak more on uh, copyright considerations and 3D printing. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and just let you know that uh, none of the information that I share today uh, is intended to be legal advice. Please consult with an attorney or if you work at a cultural institution where you have uh, in-house counsel, uh, please uh, connect with them regarding any questions uh, regarding copyright and 3D printing. Um, the ideas and the information that I share today uh, is my own. Thank you. All right, and I, with that, am going to share my screen and, okay. I'm hoping everyone can see this. Uh, it looks great. All You're right. Great. great. All right, so 3D printing, um, just as an overview, 3D printing touches on all three major areas of intellectual property law. Uh, I should also make a note that I'm specifically going to be speaking about intellectual property and copyright as it is governed here in the United States. Um, it is important to be aware that copyright laws do vary uh, depending on the jurisdiction of the country. Um, so within the US, uh, one of the three major areas, the three major areas of intellectual property law are trademark, copyright, and patent. Uh, with trademark, we have uh, what is an identifying mark, like a name, logo, or slogan that allows consumers to connect to a good, to a good or a service uh, to its source. Copyright uh, is the legal right held by the creator of an original work. Uh, and this right uh, arises immediately after an original tangible work is created. And this is the area that we're gonna focus on because copyright is really um, uh, analogous to, uh, to artwork uh, in the creation of original art. And then we also have patent. A patent provides legal rights to the owner of an uh, invention or mechanism uh, that prevents any other person from manufacturing, using or selling or importing the product substance or process under patent protection. Um, just as a side note, most recently, I know there was a dispute that arose in Italy uh, during the height of the pandemic there, where um, I think local engineers had created uh, or recreated a breathing valve designed for a medical device and digitally printed it with a 3D printer uh, without permission of the patent holder. And the patent holder was a company in the United States. And so this really raised a lot of issues around uh, and, and also potentially ethical concerns about enforcing intellectual property rights during a medical emergency. Um, but it also showed how easy it is for, for anyone to possibly infringe on the intellectual property rights uh, owned by another uh, via the use of 3D printers. So as I mentioned today, we're gonna focus on copyright um, as one of the tenements of intellectual property law. And, um, you know, the rules around copyright and 3D printing in the United States are governed by the current laws of copyright, namely the Copyright Act of 1976, as well as the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, which uh, governs more of the online copyright uh, use. And both both the uh, statutes, both laws are very important uh, within the context of museums and cultural institutions um, because of the nature of the work in reproducing uh, images, reproducing uh, original art, which is really a right that is exclusive to the copyright holder. And so uh, because museums seek to reproduce <laughs> artwork images, uh, often for their various exhibitions and programming. Um, we are then uh, creating derivative works uh, uh, as part of those artworks. And in a lot of ways, 3D printing can be viewed in the same way. Um, when we take a, an image of an artwork, it's more of a two-dimensional uh, image, uh, but with 3D printing, we can now create these 3D printed uh, reproductions. Um, but it's important to note that the laws don't really change and that 
the current laws that we have uh, are, are, are pertinent to 3D printing um, as well. Uh, it's also true that there's not a lot of case law in the area of 3D printing, um, maybe because it's a relatively new technology for the mainstream. I know that 3D printing um, first started probably um, as far back as the 80s, um, but as far as coming into the mainstream realm, it's still a fairly new uh, uh, technology that uh, may be used uh, in a more mainstreamed way. And so we haven't had too many uh, legal case laws or legal disputes on the matter. However, there, there is one that I'd like to highlight, and this was the Penrose Triangle Takedown Notice. Um, and so just for a little bit of background, uh, the Penrose Triangle was a design created by a Swedish graphic artist named Oscar Rudersvard, uh, who created this optical illusion in the 1930s. And then in 2011, a design file was posted onto Thingiverse, which is an on online site that allows users to post their designs for 3D printed objects. Um, in 2011, uh, a designer named Ulrich uh, Schwanitz uh, wanted to send a copyright takedown notice to Thingiverse claiming to be the owner of the copyright in the 3D printed version of the object, uh, claiming that the design files infringed on his copyright. And, you know, essentially there was kind of a public outcry and uh, Schwanitz relented and offered his uh, digital file of the Penrose Triangle uh, into the public domain. And so I raise this because it's always an interesting question of whether um, taking a re or reproducing an original design or uh, a work, an object, uh, when we think of photographing an artwork, when we create that copy or that derivative work, are there any underlying work or rights that the reproducer then has? So in the context of 3D printing, uh, if we take a design and create a digital code in order to create a 3D printed object, uh, does that designer of the code now have uh, intellectual property rights uh, in the creation of that 3D file. And these are still a lot of matters that are very much in a gray area. Um, they often will hinge on a, the severability doctrine, um, which basically uh, the courts will look to see if there's anything unique, is there any unique uh, identifying mark to the copy that would give it some originality or is it merely just an exact copy of the original? And I think this also applies uh, when we look at uh, the museum or cultural institutional use of 3D objects. Um, there is in the United States, we have the doctrine of fair use and fair use, I'm not going to get into it too much because it's a conversation all on its own, but it was also codified in the Copyright Act of 1976. And it, there's a four part test uh, to, to fair use. One being the purpose, uh, evaluating the purpose and character of the use. Two, um, looking at the nature of the copyright, copyrighted work. Three, looking into the amount and substantiality of the portion taken. And four, the effect of the use upon the potential market. So that's what is often used to evaluate a, a fair use uh, case um, if it goes through the courts. And, you know, fair use often comes up uh, for museums as well uh, in the event that we are you know, if a rights holder comes uh, with question about why a museum uh, reproduce uh, a certain object, we may be able to argue uh, fair use. It's a very gray area of the law and it's often very dependent on a case by case basis. Um, at this point in time, it's, 
To my knowledge, it's not widely known if museums or cultural institutions are using 3D printers as a tool uh, to document, conserve, or exhibit artworks uh, apart from works that are created by artists using 3D printing as their medium or in a specific case where an artist has bestowed through the acquisition process uh, the digital file in which to create the 3D printed object. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the advantages and best practices of 3D printing. Um, there are lots of advantages to, to the use of this uh, technology. And one coming from a conservation point of view, it would allow for a greater study uh, of an object uh, or of an artwork. Um, I've also uh, understand that 3D printing can be used as a tool in exhibition design. Um, thinking maquettes, I know oftentimes when an exhibition is being organized, it is very helpful to see a smaller uh, version of the exhibition as it would be um, installed uh, using tiny maquettes. And 3D printing could be a great tool uh, for being able to envision the exhibition design um, on a smaller scale. And then also one of the advantages of 3D printing is that it could bring life to older objects in the collection and particularly those in the public domain. Um, I was, while I was doing some of my research, I was reading about how many artists are using uh, 3D printing um, as part of their tools and as part of their medium. And I came across uh, this quote uh, from these are designers named Rob and Nick Carter in London. And they said they created sculptures through 3D printing uh, that were inspired by centuries old paintings of, for example, sunflowers after Vincent van Gogh. And according to them, they said they wanted to bring old master works to life, to marvel at Dutch golden age realism and share in that culture's delight of nature. It became our ambition to create a body of work that rewarded viewers for the extra time spent looking through the introduction of new and interesting elements. We want to slow down the viewer, draw them in, and make them re-examine the work and re-look at a painting. And so when you think of 3D printed works, I think it's, it's great um, for, for collections that do have a lot of objects that are no longer rights protected or are in the public domain. Um, 3D printing can be a really great tool to use in um, recreating, reproducing these artworks in a way that can uh, further, create more engagement um, to audiences, maybe even uh, provide opportunities for, uh, for more tactile engagement. I know um, oftentimes in museums, uh, it, perhaps it's a bit of human nature, but there is often this desire to touch and hold <laughs> objects. And 3D printing might be able, may be a really great tool to address um, some of those desires to touch and feel an object, um, particularly of those works that are no longer rights protected. And so I'm gonna now pivot a little bit to best practices um, when seeking uh, to, uh, and using 3D uh, printed technology technology uh, in collections. I thought Peter did a wonderful job of uh, discussing the pre-acquisition conversations and pre-acquisition questions uh, that can often come up um, when a museum is acquiring uh, a work or an object uh, that is uh, 3D printed or uses 3D printed materials. I think it's very important from a rights point of view uh, to communicate if the artist is living um, 
it's really great to to have those conversations directly with the artists um, so that uh, the museum can really understand further how uh, how to conserve and how to steward uh, these objects. Um, but it's very important also to state your reasons. Uh, what are the benefits to the museum? Um, if the object or if the artist has also bestowed the digital file to the museum as part of uh, the acquisition, um, really understanding what that enables the museum to do and how the museum can further preserve uh, and conserve the work into, uh, into the future and in perpetuity. Um, as far as language uh, in agreements, uh, we, <laughs> it really does depend on a case by case basis. However, um, there is language that can be included into agreements um, that provides kind of broad usage. And one, some of that language um, in agreements, and I quote, uh, could, be, um, could be written as the artist hereby grants to whatever the name of the acquiring uh, body is, a worldwide perpetual royalty-free and irrevocable license to copy, use, distribute, perform, display, or otherwise create images or recordings of the final work without restrictions, and this is the key, in whole or in part in any media, whether now known or hereafter devised. And so that language really gives a very broad, <laughs> broad use and a very broad interpretation in terms of how, how the museum or how the acquiring body may use and reproduce the work or the license that is obtained um, when acquiring the work. Now, of course, a rights holder could um, take issue with some of the language there, or maybe place a little bit more restrictions around what uh, in any media, whether now known or hereafter devised, actually means. But uh, you know, it is one way in order to kind of provide a catch-all for current technologies and technologies that may be made and created in the future and that the museum will be able to reproduce or have a license to reproduce uh, the, the, the object that has been acquired using these new technologies that are with us currently and the, the technologies to come. Lastly, I'm gonna to touch a little bit more on artists and 3D printing. Um, so here we have an image of the artist Shirley uh, C's work, Negotiated Differences. And uh, as part of this work, the artist uh, used 3D printing, uh, used 3D printed materials in the creation of the work, and in particularly the joints that connect the pieces together. So if you looking at this image, you can see that there's kind of these joints that connect uh, these objects together. And it's my understanding that the artist also applied a Creative Commons license to the digital file uh, for these, these joints. <laughs> and this enabled users to reproduce these materials provided that they adhere to the license created by the author. And so that's also another point uh, that is very important to make is that with Creative Commons, I think Creative Commons is a really wonderful tool and platform um, for users to share content uh, without, uh, you know, the current copyright restrictions uh, or to set their own parameters around usage. Um, However, it's very important that when using or, or using content from Creative Commons, that, that you pay particular attention to the structure of the license that the author has set uh, on that uh, object or on that image. Um, a common uh, license that you see associated, a common, a common Creative Commons license that you see associated with 3D printing is the CC BYNC 
and D. And what that means is that if you are to use or reproduce uh, this object, uh, the license requests that you provide attribution, as well as that you not use it for, that it's used for a non-commercial purpose. So that it's not used and then uh, reproduced or distributed for sale. And then that there are no derivatives of the artwork. So in some cases, there are restrictions that could come with using Creative Commons licenses. It's, it's not necessarily that it's a free for all that you can, you find a, an object or an image or a, a code uh, on a, via a Creative Commons license that you can just do whatever you wish. But there are some parameters that uh, a rights holder can set. And so depending on the type of use, uh, users can go uh, and reprint uh, the joints that Shirley uh, C. used in her piece, Negotiated Differences, provided that they abide by this Creative Commons license that the artist has set around usage. And with that, I am going to stop.